Do we plan for crises? Do you have it mapped out? I mean, I, I plan my preaching schedule kind of a year in advance, and I have it written up in a Google sheet, and in the weeks that I'm going to be sick, an hour and a half before the service, I highlight that so that I can be prepared. <laughs> Don't you? Plan for crises? Uh, when Jeannie and I were married, we said, well, these are the t- we're going to have four good years, and then we're going to have this difficulty that we're going through. No, they kind of surprise us, don't they? We are not God. We don't get to pick when the crisis happens, when difficult times come. And the reality is that when those times come, we are, our faith is put to the test a bit. Some of the assumptions that we have Because we've made plans for white picket fences and houses and children and cars and vacations and whatever. What have we made plans for? And something comes and capsizes those plans and says, no, we're not not going to go that route. There's something else happening. And if you live long enough walking with Jesus, you're going to struggle. I remember as a young man thinking, going to church, because everybody dresses up nice and smiles and is friendly at church, I thought everybody's life was really great, and people's lives are great, but what I didn't realize is that you are surrounded by people that are going through different difficulties, crises, struggles, and when we come together as a church family, we're not the people that are finished and everything's complete and never figured out. The truth is that we go through difficulties that challenge our assumptions challenge our faith, and we come together to encourage each other and build each other up that God's mercies are new every morning, that he is faithful, that the crisis isn't surprising him, and that because of Jesus Christ, he speaks emphatically of his love and great mercy and faithfulness to us today. As we look at the promise found in Jeremiah 33, 14 to 18, I want you to know that this promise is spoken into a significant national crisis. Imagine being in that moment when you are being, your world is being upended. Have you experienced that? That's what this promise is being spoken into in Jeremiah 33, 14 to 18. So if you turn with me, we'll see that Jesus is the righteous branch of David. And we'll read Jeremiah 33, 14 to 18. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. Jesus is the righteous branch of David. As we see this promise being given in verse 14, I want to look behind us here and take a moment to see this work that Andy did putting up the different promises from the prophets that we've seen. And you'll see that you shall be my people and I will be your God and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and I will put my spirit within you. Just randomly looking at Emmanuel, you see that one to the right? God with us. That shall be his name. There are these incredible promises that are found in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, but the life condition that's going on in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel is one of crisis. In Isaiah's lifetime, Israel, in Isaiah's ministry, Israel is in crisis and is going to lose its national national position as Assyria comes and takes them. And there's the Pending doom out there for Judah because of their failures. Have you ever gone through a crisis that you caused? That your sin caused? That your failure was the problem? 
That's where Israel is right now. And when Jeremiah is prophesying, he's prophesying at the threshold of Israel, of Judah, losing its position, of Jerusalem being taken. And as this promise is being spoken, if you were to go back in chapter 32 and verse 1, you would see the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the tenth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah. So Zedekiah is still king, which was the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the guard. That was the palace of the king of Judah. Jeremiah is telling people that this doom is coming, this judgment is coming, Babylon is going to come, and you are going to lose your position, you're going to lose the nation, the kingdom is going to be taken away for now, and the temple is going to be sacked. And the Jews who lived at that time in Judah were ticked at, Jeru- at Jeremiah. So they put him in prison. Why can't you give us a nice prophecy? Why can't you say it's going to work out great and tell us that the sun will rise again and everything's going to be fine? The reality is he was saying that God's faithfulness will bring about a promise that's better and beyond anything you can imagine. But for now, this is a bitter pill to swallow. And so ticked were they at Jeremiah that Jeremiah not only is, has to prophesy about the coming doom, he's prophesying to people that hate him for it and put him in jail. In this moment when the city is being besieged, in this moment when Jeremiah is in prison, he speaks this promise by the power and presence of God. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I have often thought, what would I do if I were God? I've often thought it because I have prayed for people, and I think, if I were God, I would fix this. If I were God, I would make this go away, this crisis. If I were God, I would solve this financial problem. If I... But good news, I'm not God. I also want you to know that if I were God and people had failed for a thousand years and I am now seeing them bear the fruit, reap the, reap the product that is the, from the sin that they've been sinning, I do not make a promise like he does here in verse 14. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and house of Judah. I'm not done with you. In fact, the best is yet to come. I am going to take care of you. I am going to remember my promise to you. You maybe didn't remember your promise to me, but I will remember my promise to you, and I will be true to it. This is the promise that God gives. In fact, again and again, we saw Dr. Norbeck preach last week, Behold, the days are coming, and speaking of a new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This is spoken not when everything is great. This is spoken when everything seems lost. When everything seems ruined. Out of the ashes of hopelessness, God says, hang on. I am a God who is faithful whose mercies are new every morning, who will renew and restore. I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah because of his character, because of who he is. He is not defined by our failures. He is defined by his promises. Verse 15, it says, In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. In those days and at that time, there is coming a time, they're looking at the crisis that is, they believed God would always have a thro- on the throne a king from David because of sec- uh, second, first Samuel chapter 7. Second Samuel chapter 7, forgive me. There was a promise to God, that God gave to David that there would be one on the throne always, and he's going to repeat it here in our second point. But Jesus fulfills the promise to David that there will be one who reigns on the throne forever. 
Who is this person? He is a righteous branch that will spring up for David. He's, right, he's, he's, he's a good king. In those days, at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. That means when, imagine a, a tree that's been dead for, well, six, 650 years, 680 years. A tree that's been dead for all those years and it looks like there is no hope and no one has sat on the throne. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulders. The son of David. And Jesus was born. And who caused it to happen? Was it finally they were good enough to receive this? No, it is God who is causing. I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David. And this promise is not after they've paid enough for their sin, not after they've gone through enough difficulty. The truth is, right in the middle of their failure, God says, I will cause a righteous shoot to come up from the house of David, a righteous branch that will cause this tree to live forever. They will not be defined by death. They will not be defined by destruction. They will not be defined by failure, and they will not be defined by their sin. They will be defined by my righteousness, my goodness, and my mercy. And so are we. Jesus fulfills the promise to David. They couldn't have seen how good this promise would mean. What they could imagine at that point in the beginning. Maybe I imagined a life when I was 15 or 16 years old and I was baptized. I imagined a life that had lots of good in it and I didn't imagine the pitfalls. I didn't imagine the difficulties. I didn't imagine death. I didn't imagine disease. I couldn't see it coming. I didn't plan for it. At the same time, I did not plan for how good God is. I couldn't see it. I couldn't see how amazingly kind he was going to be to me in my difficulties. Our God shows his heart while Jeremiah is in prison, while the king is failing and put him there. And while Babylon is at the gates and they're besieged because of their sin, and he says, I will fulfill the promise to David. Jesus is the righteous king. He shall execute justice, halfway through verse 15. And he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. What does it mean that he will execute justice and righteousness? That means he's going to go around with a big sword and he's going to knock out the bad guys and lift up the good guys? No, he's going to bring shalom to the land. He's going to heal people of their sins. We've seen the promise again and again from the very first sermon in this series. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them whiter than snow. He will cleanse us. He's going to purify us. He's going to take care of the sin problem. I can't imagine before Christ came that anybody understood what God was promising. But he's promising a righteous king, one who is going to take care of the justice problem, the fact that we've failed and we've hurt people. How's he going to do that? How's he going to solve the sin problem? And how is he going to make us right in how we treat each other and how we treat God? How is he going to accomplish that? Jesus Christ is the righteous king. Verse 16, in those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. I love that picture. Judah and Jerusalem. Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. What are they saved from? They're saved from a thousand years of failure. They're saved from sin that's so pervasive that it affects how we treat God and how we treat each other and how we treat ourselves. Has anyone had a, a life of, that's been marked by sin? Have you seen the cost of it? 
They've seen the failure that comes with it. Jesus is the righteous king who makes sense of it because he gives us his righteousness. And by the power of the Spirit, he gives us the ability to live with righteousness. Shalom with God and with each other. Peace. This miracle that's promised causes Jerusalem to dwell securely. I love that part of the promise because they are in a position right now where Babylon is holding them besieged. They can't go out the gates. They can't get away. There's no place to run that feels secure. How do they sleep at night? How would you sleep at night if someone had your town besieged and the, the promise for the future is that your home is going to be taken away, your jobs are going to be taken away, your 401k doesn't matter. How do you sleep? And he is going to cause us to dwell securely. What does that mean? How do we rest? We rest because of who he is. How did the Israelites rest? They rest. Can you imagine Jeremiah in prison on top of all the rest of the stuff I just described? His own people putting him in prison? How did he sleep? Where does peace come from? Where does righteousness come? Where does security come from? Real security. Does security come from how much you've saved? Does security come from the job you have? Anybody lost a job abruptly? We make our plans, but that's not where our security is. God promises a time in those days Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord our righteousness. This is the name by which Jerusalem will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. What is the banner that goes before Jerusalem and Judah in this promise? He's the one who's right. He's the one who's good. And there's one who is coming to reign on the throne of David who will cause me to dwell securely and cause me all eyes on Jesus. One day, all of us will stand before God. Anybody with me, all eyes on Jesus? It's not what I've done. It's what he accomplished for me on the cross. We can dwell securely. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Now, verse 17 speaks to that promise in, 1 Samuel, in 2 Samuel chapter 7. I'll get that right by the end of the sermon. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Here he dwell, speaks to that promise. Why is that promise so important in 586 B.C.? The reason that is so important is that there's about to be no one on the throne from a human perspective. From a human perspective, they could only see the promise in terms of what happens here, right now, and right now they are about to lose the throne. In fact, maybe that's why the king threw Jeremiah in prison. I've got a promise here that says that I won't lose my throne, and then he lost his throne. And Babylon took him away. Then, for 586 years, no one was on the throne. Other countries ruled. First, the Babylonians, the Persians, Medo Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. And Jerusalem was in the middle of of powers that were bigger than them fighting. Like, it was like right on the bridge where once, once Alexander was done reigning and it was split into three countries, they fought over the top of Jerusalem. They were just beat up. A crisis that didn't seem to make sense when God made this promise. David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Was there ever a Jew who prayed, 
in those 586 years. I don't understand what you mean. It feels like you've forgotten us. It feels like we're all alone. Why won't you fight for us? And from nation to nation that ruled over them, from generation to generation, they were wondering, where is God in this? And the answer is in Jesus Christ. That in Jesus Christ, we see the promise ultimately fulfilled and the shalom that he's promising is one of a future Jerusalem, ultimately. Where the Israelites and the, both the north and the southern kingdom come back and are reunited and are under God's reign through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, the one that we have been celebrating since from Christmas to Easter, this year through these promises and crises is the one who gives real, lasting hope. The truth is that if I was God, I would go around putting Band-Aids on problems today. What God did was solve the sin problem so that we could live eternally. Now You may be crying out saying, God, I don't understand why this is so hard. I don't understand why you did what you did. I encourage you this morning to look at the cross. I encourage you this morning to consider again your faith in Jesus Christ, the righteous King. It's interesting to me that Fred, who was the first one to decide to be baptized, he chose to be baptized in between two crises. And uh, I question whether he should have joined the bridge, because since he's joined the bridge, it's cancer and heart issues. I... What a delight to be part of a family that you're part of, but what occurred to you in the middle of it was, I need to be baptized in, my, in front of my family. I need to declare my faith in Jesus Christ between these crises. And before he goes in for the surgery, he wanted you all to know that he has placed his faith in Jesus Christ, his Savior. And he dwells securely. Right? How about your crisis? Do you dwell securely? Jesus is the righteous king. Jesus is the sufficient sacrifice. Look in verse 18. And this is one of the head scratchers from a whole Old Testament perspective. The Messiah is spoken of, the coming of the Messiah is spoken of two things that that happen that seem to be at odds. One is that the Messiah will bring a reign of David back, but also the Messiah will bring the priestly worship back. So you might think that this is two guys that bring the king and priesthood because the king comes from the line of Judah, from the line of David, and the priests come from the line of Levi. So how can God make this promise right side by side, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, to make sacrifices forever. I imagine what they said is this has to be two different people. But God says, and it's clarified for us in the the book of Hebrews, that my man, my son, is going to be the promised Davidic king, the one that I promised from the beginning. He is going to be the promised priest. And in the promised priest, how, does, how can he be from the line of Judah? Doesn't it against the Mosaic law for someone from the line of Judah to be a priest? And if you're so inclined and want to read in Hebrews chapter 7, you'll see the argument made that he is before the priesthood that of, of Levi, that he is of the line of Melchizedek. And if you remember the story in Genesis uh, Abraham went and actually offered sacrifices to a priest named Melchizedek. And in essence, God makes Jesus the priest that is before even Abraham. Now, I don't think that this is Melchizedek, that Jesus was Melchizedek. I think what the argument is, is that 
Jesus is beyond the Mosaic Law. He's before the Mosaic Law. He's the writer of the Mosaic Law. And he was there before Abraham. He created Abraham. He was there at the beginning of the world. And he is the only one that can advocate for us as a priest. And as Hebrews builds the argument in uh, chapter uh, 9, uh, verses 11 to 15, um, he builds the argument that the priesthood that was before had to keep offering sacrifices for themselves and for us. They, they, they couldn't stop. Year after year, they had to offer blood. And last week, Dr. Norbeck talked about the blood and the life. It was really cool to hear it from a surgeon's perspective, wasn't it? But you see him talking about offering the blood, and Hebrews argues that all those priests that preceded had to be offering blood again and again, and it never completed the work. And they had to offer again and again for us because the sin problem kept coming back and kept coming back. And in the Mosaic Law, there was not the hope that we needed, but there is a new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ, the high priest who once and for all took care of the sacrifice for our sins so that we don't have to worry about it anymore. There is no other sacrifice that we need. In 1 Timothy 2.5, It says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The mediator of a new covenant in verse 15 of Hebrews 9, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Jesus is king, he reigns over us, And he reigns differently than the kings who reigned before. Do you remember it early on, if you were here in the series, uh, my son-in-law at the Christmas service talked about uh, the kings and how much they take, 1 Samuel 8. Uh, And they're taking and taking, and they're going to take your sons, they're going to take your daughters, they're going to take your land, they're going to take your crop, they're going to take it, they're just going to take. And that's what you're asking, that's the human king Jesus gives. Jesus didn't come to take, he came to give, he came to serve. And he gave his life for us. He is the king we've been longing for. He is the priest we've been longing for, the one who goes between us and God, who has solved the problem of our brokenness before God. You no longer need to worry about your sin. You no longer need to worry about what's going to happen between me and the Father because Jesus Christ has solved that problem And he bridges the gap between us and God. And today, he mediates between God and man. Still. He prays for us. Hebrews 4 says he sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. Do you know that God sympathizes with you in your weakness? Do you know that he knows your story? Do you know that he loves more than anyone else and he saw every tear? Do you know that he knew the crisis He mapped it out on your Google sheet of your life. This is where it's going to hit. But I'll pray for them that it doesn't crush them. That they'll remain. And that that will be turned into glory. As they put their trust in Jesus, the king that we've longed for and the priest that we need the only high priest. When our story becomes desperate, and I could list off a couple of my own, times when you're asking God why, it doesn't make sense. You could fix this like that. Why is this happening? When our stories become desperate, our assumptions are challenged, our complacencies are long gone, and when everything is stripped away, the question is, where is your faith? In the middle of this crisis, God again and again is in essence saying, put your faith in me, I'm good. All the places you've been putting your faith will not measure up. It will not suffice. 
There is one place you can put your trust that will turn in to shalom with me and shalom with others. Do you believe God is faithful even when you're in a crisis? One thing I believe crises do is it forces you to ask that question. What do you believe? And there's no greater declaration. Everyone's watching. I mean, the people who are close to you are watching. My dad and mom went through two or three crises in my childhood, and what is etched on my brain is what they did next. They preach a sermon so clear about what they believe by what they did in the crisis. So a crisis can knock you down for a little bit. It can beat you up for a little bit. But let me encourage you that Jesus Christ is not done telling this story. And his promises are true. You can trust him. So let us spur one another on to love and good deeds because Jesus reigns forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I am surprised that in the midst of our failures, in a season of loss, that your promises come through so clearly and so emphatically and so surprisingly. But I am so thankful that you are a God who sees our crises, who sees our difficulties, and speaks into them. Father, for the Jewish people, I pray for them. I pray that they would return to you in mass, that they would trust your Son, and they would know the hope that is found in Jesus Christ alone, their high king and their priest. In Jesus' name, amen.